going to be hitting a, a couple topics as we begin our thermochemistry unit, but if you're looking for a best title, enthalpy will be our main focus today and it'll be our, our pretty much our only focus tomorrow. Um, but thermochemistry, all right, as a whole, it's looking at the movement of heat during reactions, all right? So we're going to track energy movements um, during chemicals doing things and moving around. And uh, we can calculate how much energy is there, how much heat is there, and whatnot. Um, I will be, I was one example short of finishing last period, so I'll be teaching probably eight or nine minutes into next period. You're welcome to stay. Um, just don't be loud for the video. When the bell cuts me off, Isaac moves to your assigned seat, brother. I hear you. All right. Okay. Um, so, I forgot what it is. Um, all right, so in chemistry, uh, energy is, uh, is going to be directly connected to heat. Um, the law of conservation of energy will always be important to you, just knowing that however much energy there is in the universe is constant. All we can do is move it around, all right? Um, and really our, our big focus, like I said, today and tomorrow is enthalpy, which is going to be a change in heat. So anytime you see delta H, that is referring to enthalpy, the heat change in a system, whether it's coming in or going out. Now, speaking of the heat going in and going out, um, sorry, I'm rusty too. Iron oxide, get it? Rusty, <laughs> chemical joke. Uh, speaking of uh, heat moving in or moving out, that of course is referring to exo and endothermic. Um, talked about last year, we've touched on it a couple times during this year. Um, I think Le Chatelier was the last time we talked about endo and exo, um, which was based on whether the heat was a reactant or a product. But a couple things that you absolutely have to know to survive this unit. So a reminder. If the change in heat is a negative value, it is exothermic. If the change in heat is a positive value, it's endothermic. Another thing that you want to make sure you remember, just because they like to ask it in this way, is if they give you an energy diagram, and if you're ever given reactants that have less energy than the products, then that must be a, an endothermic reaction. All right, because the energy has gone into the reaction to make that happen. Of course, the opposite would be if you had your reactants, all right, and then you ended up with your products down here. Yes, Dylan? Yes, I like it. You want to come say that? To the okay, that okay. question. Yes. So, what can, so like that R traveling up toward the P, like, is that how like the like that diagram is represented? Yeah, yeah. Usually it'll because it, it won't just it won't just go directly to the P because you'll have to hit an act, an activation energy in order to make it happen. That's what that's showing. But yeah, no, it shows it exactly like this. Yeah, it's like if you see that's climbing more than the R. Right, right. right. This okay. the, this would be energy as a function of time. So, oh, okay. okay. But anyway, um, so that that should be review, but just the foundation before we start using this in the form of some calculations. Okay, so what is the most level one exoendothermic question they can ask you? It would be one of these, but usually there's one on there. All right, so you don't want to miss this question. In order to tell me whether a situation is endo or exo, you just have to, you have to look at the enthalpy. What direction is the heat moving? How is it changing? It's generally easy to do, but after teaching this for a long time, uh, y'all just love to get backwards. So. Whatever the, the topic is, whatever the item is that is changing temperatures is what is what is considered the reaction, all right? But you want to just look at the item that's changing temperature and basically figure out if it's getting hotter or colder. If it's getting colder, it's exothermic. The heat's going bye-bye. If it's getting hotter, it's endothermic. The heat's coming in. So let's see how easy this is on these examples. By the way, make sure you have your slides at home so that you're following along. Water freezes. Is the water getting hotter or colder? 
it's getting the water's getting it's colder. colder. Therefore, where's the heat going? It's leaving. It's, it's going freezing. away. That is exothermic. And you can remember because it's X for exit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dylan. Wait, so what the systems the surroundings? Well, in this case, the surroundings is going to be everything that's not the system. So the surroundings are going to be getting warmer in this case <laughs> since it's exothermic. Oh, okay. All right. So that because the surroundings is everything that's not the system. Um, all right, the hand getting cold, uh, the hand gets cold. Now I don't even care about the other stuff. I just care about what the topic is and whether it's getting warm or cold. All right, and really there is no cold. It's just getting warm or less warm. But we're gonna say cold anyway because we're human. So the hand gets cold. That's enough information for me. Exo. Exo. What? So basically, like it's a, you can conclude that like anytime it's gonna be getting colder, it's exo. In general, but but you'll see that they'll start to throw phase changes at you. Oh, okay. All right. So, but we can. But let's go through all the examples. Ice gets warmer, and I don't care why. The ice gets warmer. It must be endo. Heat's coming in. If it's gonna get warmer. All right. Water boils. I can stop right there. Water boils. That must be endo. Endo. All right. All right. Now, now here's where they start to throw the phase changes. Now, for the phase change words, just. Make sure that you remember the solid, liquid, and gas and just what they mean. Because if you're going towards the solid phase, it's getting colder. All right, it's losing heat. It's going towards the gaseous phase, of course, it's gaining energy because the gases are those particles that are moving quick. All right? So water vapor condenses. You just have to make sure you know what condensation is. A I'm sorry, a gas turning into a liquid. So we're moving towards the solid phase. Getting colder, so it would be exothermic to get colder it has to leave yeah no, that's the question why i'm already not going to finish so be nice to me i'd like to be able to eat my lunch during my break um okay ice cream melts the ice cream is getting warmer so it's endo you're good all right water drops evaporate evaporation all right, evaporation is gonna require me to go from a gas, I'm sorry, from a liquid to a gas, getting hotter, endo. All right, now, if you're one of those out there that are just naturally bad at this, all right, you've just gotta practice, all right? Because on every problem I hear somebody whisper the wrong answer. So I, I, I don't know the simpler way to explain it. You just gotta have that connection where if it's getting colder, then the heat is going away. If it's going towards the solid, it's exo. Anything to find an absolute to write down. Okay, so let's talk about the main thing, because that really is all very level one. Let's move up to level two. How do we calculate enthalpy? Now again, my enthalpy is going to be delta H. We're just looking at the heat changing. There's five ways that i found that AP asks these questions. We're gonna cover the first two today, the next three tomorrow, all right? So there they are. So let's jump into, uh, we'll start with what I think is the simplest one to understand, which is stoichiometry. Since you're already so good at it. All right, guys, um, so Stoichiometry, again, just as we go into it, always in the back of your head, especially when we get to the second one. Positive delta H's are endo, negative delta H's are exo. That's going to be uh, absolutely um, vital. Um, so this is just the interest slide of stoichiometry. Let's get to a problem. So there we go. This is the combustion of propane. It's already balanced for you, which is really nice. Let's take a look at what it gives us about it, though. It tells us, okay, here's the combustion of propane, and look at the delta H. Hey, is combustion an exo or endothermic reaction? Combust, it's gonna be exo. Like I said, I mean, look at the number. Is the number positive or negative? Positive. It's, it's negative. It's negative, right? Oh, there you I was Sorry. No, um, 5, anyway, so if you're given delta H, you don't have to do that, oh, my hand's getting colder stuff. If the delta H is given to you, then just look at the sign, all right? The sign is everything. So it's negative, exothermic, cool. But let's look at what it's asking. It says if you have five grams of propane, 
All right, what will the delta H be? Now, look at the problem though. How many moles of propane are reacting in the problem? Just one, all right? So that number, that delta H that's giving me is what we get when one mole combusts, all right? This wants to know what happens if five grams combust. So there's a couple issues there. First off, that delta H is connected to how many moles are doing things. And it's giving me grams. We can fix that very easy, but make sure you fix it. But then still using dimensional analysis, I can connect five moles to, I'm sorry, uh, five grams to that number. So let me show you what I mean. So I'm going to take the five grams. It gave me five grams of propane. Now, like I said, my information is based off moles of propane. So let's, let's convert that real quick. So I can go grams of propane down here to convert it to moles of propane. Of course, this would be one to periodic table. And the periodic table here is 44.1 to save us time. That's three C's and eight H's. Now I've got moles, all right? So that's good, all right? So what we can do now is since the reaction is telling me one mole of propane gives this delta H, I can find out what five grams will do by simply saying, all right, diagonal, we'll go moles of C3H8. And as the reaction says, every one mole of that gives me a delta H of negative 2221. Yes, that's exactly right. Here, wait, I, I want to I talk about what Reagan just asked. She said, is this one coming from the coefficient? It is. If this question was asking about oxygen, if it said, you have five grams of O2, all right, well, well, that number would have been different. But what would this number have been if oxygen is what we were looking at? It would be a five, all right? Because, look, look just look at the reaction. This says, if you combust one mole of propane, it gives you that much. If you combust five moles of oxygen, it gives you that much, all right? So with that in mind, it happens to be asking about propane. But if it was asking about O2, this would be a five with that same number up top because they're equal to each other. Run the grid. I'm not gonna be very patient with your algebra today. If you understand how I put all the numbers there, then that's all that really matters. If algebra is an issue, you just need to come to tutoring. But I get negative 252 kilojoules. Uh, next one. All right, now this next example will um, kind of hit home the uh, conversation about that one not having to be a one. And the reason I like to bring it up is I know a lot of y'all are addicted to always putting one as a mole ratio, but remember in stoichiometry that wasn't true. All right, the trick is the squares being equal to each other in the grid. All right, and one mole of this equals that. One mole of that equals that. So that's always true. Diego. What, uh, that negative two Yes, yeah, it was the amount it was the amount of heat given off, all right? Given off because it's exo, that's why I said it like that. Yeah. It was the amount of heat given off if 5 grams react. All right? Does the state of matter uh, matter? No. Does it matter? But you matter. Your matter matters to me. Thank you so much. Not you. Okay. Oh. Um so, let's take a look at this one. Um now, it's stoichiometry again. It should feel like the exact same type of problem, but it's actually a little bit nicer. Um, it's balanced again. That's cool. It's a reaction between sodium and oxygen. But what I see here is that it's giving me one mole of sodium oxide. Where did I miss? Oh, I missed all of it. Thanks. All right. One mole of sodium oxide, all right, and then it's asking the same kind of thing. 
What is immediately nicer about this problem? It starts in moles. Starts in moles. We don't have to do that grand mole thing, all right? Because that's what the problem is telling us. It's giving us a mole ratio that's required to produce a certain delta H. So right away, I can go straight to, okay, well, that's how many moles we're dealing with. So if I bring down my moles of sodium oxide and we go straight to the delta H, which is negative 828 kilojoules this time. What number goes here? Two. Because in the problem, this is only produced when two of these are produced, which is making this, again, equal to each other, the entire point of dimensional analysis. Again, my job, guys, is to show you as many different ways they can ask it. That's all I can do and then let you practice. So another fun way that they can see if you know your stuff is based off this type of reaction that's showing here. I want you to look at the slide that you copied before you arrived, and you'll see that it gives you a reaction with an enthalpy, and then it wants you to compare it to another reaction, and it wants to know what would the enthalpy be of the other reaction. Look at the two reactions. What do you know to, how, how do you notice that they're connected to each other? It's reversed. All they've done is flip the yield sign. Now, you might already know this, but if you don't, write it down. If a reaction is exothermic forward, it's endothermic backwards, or vice versa, all right? But if heat is given off going this way, heat must be taken in if you're going that way. That should make logical sense to you. It's, at, it's written at the bottom of the screen. So is it just the opposite of the original? Because the more times I can get you to write something, the better it is for your brain. Carolyn, what was that? I'm sorry. So is it just the opposite of the people So Carolyn thinks she knows the answer to the question. So remember, that top reaction gave me an enthalpy. It wants to know the enthalpy for the bottom. What do you think the answer is? She thinks that the answer is negative 472, and you're, she's correct. Because all you got to do is flip the sign. If it gives off that much heat, that's how much it's got to take in. Guys, this is a question pulled from an AP multiple choice portion. All right, that is a question. Exactly, exactly. But, but still, only 46% of the students that ran into that question, got it right. Because what did they try to do? They tried to do a bunch of calculations and stuff. Well, Sometimes it is that easy. What? I try it, but you're being taught by, I don't know, God or something. Oh, yeah. It's weird. Okay. Um, I, we're we're going we're gonna to skip that. It's a... That's a, another identity. There's no twist there. We've already basically done that problem. But if you work, if you want to work it out in your notes, I'll send the answer on Schoology. Uh, let's move to number two. So what we did with stoichiometry, that is the first way to calculate enthalpy. All right? We've got four more to go. Only one more today, though. Calorimetry is the introduction of a new equation, which is always exciting. This equation's on your uh, AP reference. You don't have to memorize it. We just need to know how to use it. The Q there is going to be your total heat. The M is going to be the mass of the sample that you're analyzing. Sometimes it just gives you a sample. You have a 100 gram sample. Or sometimes it'll be a reaction where you're mixing uh, an amount of reactant with an amount of product, in which case, uh, or mixing two reactants, you would need to sum them together All right, for the total mass of what you're analyzing. Um, the C is the specific heat. Specific heat is a constant value assigned to different substances. The definition's there. It's the amount of energy that must be pumped in to whatever substance you're talking about to make its temperature go up one degree Celsius. That's how they come up 
with the specific heat readings. You don't have to memorize any of them, they'll be given to you. And then you've got delta T, which is gonna be the change in time. Um, you do not have to convert Celsius to Kelvin when running MCAT, that's what we call this as MCAT. Did I already say that? Um, because it's just a difference in numbers. The Celsius to Kelvin conversion is just adding and subtracting, therefore you don't have to do the conversion to Kelvin when you're given Celsius when using NCAT. You can, you'll get the same answer. But um, both systems are fine. So, how do we use it? Well, we can start with the, the most straightforward of examples, which is a good starting spot. Um, so, for calorimetry, we've got Q equals MCAT. All right. And uh, so we'll just start off with some basic plug and chug to make sure that you can uh, see where these numbers go. It says, how much heat must be added to change the temperature of 250 grams of water? And then it gives you a range. So how much heat means that Q is what we're looking for because Q is the total heat. Uh, M is mass. It gave us 250. C is specific heat. Now, the specific heat of water can be found at the bottom of your screen. All right, do you see it down there? Or at the bottom of your slide? You don't have to memorize it. It'll be given to you as well. Specific heats will always be given to you. I do want to ask you real quick though, you see that number 4.18? Do you think that that specific heat value, remember that's telling you how much energy has to be pumped into water in order for you to raise it one degree Celsius. Do you think that water is easier to raise the temperature of compared to other substances on Earth or harder to change the temperature of than other substances on Earth? It is. That specific heat, that 4.18, as far as specific heats go, that's a big number. A lot of them are below one. All right. So it turns out that water is actually, uh, he's kind of a bully because he, he doesn't want to change his temperature when he's mixed with other stuff. All right. He'll just slap everybody else around and make them become closer to his temperature. But anyway, that didn't matter for this problem. Um, uh, the water specific heat is 4.18. And what is always true about delta? About a, a delta, it's always what minus what. Final minus initial. So my final here is sixty. My initial here is twenty-five. You weren't sitting so far away. Yes. Oh. That's a great question. No. Um, guys, this unit's bad. This should be J slash grams degrees Celsius. I don't know. I didn't mean to leave it off. I'm sorry. And you don't have to memorize it even because, again, it's given to you. But it should be joules slash grams degrees Celsius is the rest of that unit. I'm sorry? Total heat. Okay, and then and just run it. I mean, again, if the algebra causes you issues, you're, there's only so much I can do for you, but I get uh, 37,000 joules. It's 250. That's 25. The, um, so the next problem, I, I, I'm not going to work it out. It, what it does is it, it just has C missing. It gives you Q, it gives you M, and it gives you delta T, and it has you solve for C. So you don't have to keep watching me, just plug it in. These are the simplest MCAT problems. The only thing you'll notice that instead of the next one giving you a range, it started at this and went to this. It just tells you it changed by this. It changed by one degree Celsius. So there's no say it's just one. Change in T is one degree, then. but you would solve for C, you'd have to divide. We okay? Yes. 
So how does it get tricky? Well, they like to mess up the words on you. This is another MCAT problem. Let's take a look at why it's weird. So we want to just start plugging and chugging. Uh, in this case, it wants you to find um, the final temperature. All right, so it's going to be a part of the change in T that's missing. So as I start to plug, I see, I see it says calculate the final temperature after 1575 joules of heat. There's my total heat. That's Q. So 1575. All right. Joules of heat are removed from blah, 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 blah. Look here. It's the most important thing I'll say all day. Something happened there in those words. I want you to read. I, I quit reading. I want you to read the few words that come after that number and tell me why they're being tricky. Oh, it's removed, so it's a minus. Y'all, this is a negative number. It's exothermic. It's exothermic. Therefore, it must be represented by a negative value. And this is the most common type of uh, MCAT question you're going to run into. Just that they're just going to see if you know. MCAT. Oh. Calorimetry. So again, by using context clues, I was able to conclude that it's an exothermic reaction. And exothermic reactions must always have negative heat. But now the rest is pretty easy. All right, um, my mass is, I can't read, 85. All right, the specific heat here of the ethyl alcohol is 2.4. All right, we're trying to find the final temperature, but my initial temperature was 23.5. Any questions about the way I set that up? Are you going to let them trick you into not making Q negative here? No, ain't no way. Because you're brilliant. I'll give you a second, but it probably is not long enough. Specific heat. And then T is for what? Change in temperature. Okay. I get 15.8 degrees Celsius. You're fine. It don't hurt my feelings. I'm just glad you're sitting there. <laughs> Sir, are there any other mean things they can do to us? Yeah, there are. <laughs> now, again, the wording of questions are everything. So let's take a look at what's happening here. Look at me. Look at me. They're, get, they're in this example, they're heating up a piece of metal, all right? They're taking a metal sample and they're making it hot. And then they've got water over here that's a certain temperature. They're taking this heated sample and they're putting it into the water and they're wanting to know what's going to happen. And they give you a bunch of values. Now, if they go through the trouble of this, we need to know a couple chemistry things. First off, if I take a hot sample of something and put it into a different temperature something, eventually they'll reach equilibrium. They're going to end up the same temperature, all right? We have to figure out at what rate it's going to happen, all right? But by adding a temp uh, one thing at a certain temperature to an item of a different temperature, they will end up the same temperature eventually, all right? What I also know is true about this situation is however much heat the hot metal loses when it enters the water, equals the amount of heat the water will absorb. Does that make sense? We know that, that heat, that energy is constant, law of conservation of energy, right? So if I'm going to take that hot item and it's going to cool down when it gets dropped in, however much heat is given off is the same amount that is taken in by the water. 
All right, we can't lose any. It has to all be there somewhere. With that in mind, we're able to assume those bottom equations. All right, in this scenario, we can assume that negative Q, the exothermic part, equals positive Q, the endothermic part, which was again, the negative metal, because it it's gonna give off the heat when it goes in, all right, equals the positive water, because it's the one that's endo absorbing that energy. So if negative Q equals positive Q, once they're interacting with each other, you could also then say that as negative MCAT equals positive MCAT. Questions on the theory before I solve the problem? So with this true, they've actually given us all this information. It's all there. You just had to be able to get your brain to know that this type of problem requires that type of thought. Whatever the metal loses, the water gains. Yes? Yes, then that, that, that was the start of my theory, is that eventually they will reach the equilibrium and be the same temperature. So absolutely, the final temperature will be the same on both sides of the equality. All right? So let's find us some numbers then. I need the mass of the metal, which in this case is 28.4. I need the specific heat of the metal. Well, that's what we're looking for. I need the change in temperature of the metal. All right. Well, it was heated to 110. All right. So that's the final. All right. I'm sorry. That's the initial is what it was heated up to is 110. But then after everything was said and done, the final temperature is 25.34. There's all the information about the exothermic part of the scenario, which is why there's a negative. There. Yeah? Well, let's take a look at the other guy, what it's, what it's being added to, the guy that's going to absorb the energy. What was the mass of the water? 100 grams. Guys, put a decimal after it. If you don't have it on your slide, put a decimal over it. AP never asks for one sig fig answers. It just doesn't happen. So that's a typo as far as I'm concerned. <coughs> All right. The specific heat of water is 4.18. And the change in temperature. All right. Well, we know that the final is the same, 25.34. But this water started at a temperature of 24.60. How'd you know? Like, like what did I do? Yeah? It's like it was so sharp. Like You're welcome. You're going to be my lawyer one day. Oh, I know. Uh, that's why I'm not getting divorced until you're a lawyer. Then I'll get a lawyer. <laughs> be my divorce lawyer, I get the dog. By the time, by the time he's... No, by dog I meant the wife. I get the wife. Just kidding. Just kidding. Don't you do it. He pointed at the screen. Are we good? Yeah, All right, let's keep moving. Now, I'd like to remind you, as I've mentioned before, that the multiple choice questions on the AP exam do not allow you to use a calculator. 
Now, a lot of the time, what they'll do on those is they'll ask you questions that are similar to everything I've tested you on, but instead of getting an answer, all of the answer choices are work. It wants to know if you know what you would do. And you never actually work it out. You never select an answer. It'll have this times this divided by this, all right, and show, and show um, fractions and stuff. And, and you've got to just show that you know what you would do. So it's kind of interesting and thought provoking, but, and I'll train you on it when we start doing our like mock testing in April when we get closer. But here's some good examples of mathematical questions that don't let you use a calculator. Let's take a look at the first one. I trust you. The first example says that you have 100 grams of water at a temperature being added to 100 grams of water at a different temperature. So here's what I see. Same substance, same amount of the substances, different temperatures. The only thing difference between the A and B that are being dumped into each other is their temperature. Everything else is exactly the same. Now, some of y'all could already make the conclusion I'm about to ask you to make, but if you didn't, then write it down. If everything is the same except the temperature, the temperatures will just average. If everything is the same except the temperatures, then the temperatures are just going to average. Same amount of water, and they're both water, so if I dump 90 degrees into 10 degrees, the average is 50 degrees. If everything is the same except the temperatures, then the final temperature will just be an average. So the answer is B. Let's go to the next one. All right, well, let's see what they do here. Hey, look, they're both still water. They are at a different temperature still. They're both still water, but what else is different now? The amounts, all right? One of them is 100 grams of water. The other one is five times as much water at different temperatures. And now they're being mixed together. Who do you think is going to win the battle? The one that you started with less of or the one that you started with more of? More. More. All right. So in this case, it's not going to average. It's going to end up in one of the other ranges. What's the answer? C. C. The one that you had more of was the colder one. So it makes sense that it's going to fall in the range that's closer to the colder side rather than being an average or anything else. All right, one more of these. Zoom out, what are you doing? Gosh. Now, this time, the substances are different. And the moment the substances are different, there's generally only one item to focus on, their specific heats. Look here, make sure you understand this idea of specific heat. The higher the value of specific heat, the harder it is to change the temperature of them. Remember, he's the stubborn one. So I want you to look, I want you to read that example. I want you to look at the temperature of the metal, look at the temperature of the water, they're gonna be mixed together, and decide which answer is right. We'll draw our first card of the year. Remember, yeah, you all have new seats. What does it say? Three. You have a one six chance three. Four. Four. Yeah, totally. What do you think the answer is? It's no problem. Take a stab. We'll talk about it. Sorry. He's going with A. Do you agree or disagree? I don't disagree. See, they don't know either. I disagree. I disagree. I'm going to go with B. I'm going with C. So listen, listen. All right? A is incorrect. But by mixing them together, all right, and water having such a higher specific heat than iron, water's the one that's going to say, you come to me. All right? I'm not changing. You have to change. 
So whichever temperature the item with the higher specific heat was is the one that's gonna pull the other temperature towards him. In this case, water was colder. So my range will be C, the colder range. All right, never average them unless everything is the same except temperature. Otherwise, it's not ever gonna be the average, yeah. Well, I mean, but in this case, there was multiple things. In this case, the specific heat was different, the substance was different, and the temperature was different. Technically, there's a level of chemistry that it would, but there's no way that they could get you to that level. Okay. If the moment the substances are different, you care about specific heat. Okay. All right? How much time do I have? Seven minutes. I'm doing worse than last period. Awesome. Um, again, before it happens, I just want to apologize up front. You will have to watch the end of this lecture on the video to finish your notes. Sorry. Um, okay. Coffee cup calorimetry is the last thing I want to talk about. It's one of the most common ways to do calorimetry, where basically what you do is you take a coffee cup, you put a reactant in, all right, and then you put another reactant in, and the whole reaction takes place in there. As long as you had a thermometer or some kind of measuring device in to get the initial temperature, and then when the reaction's done, you see what the temperature changed to, you could find enthalpy, right? Because that would tell you the change in heat. So it's a very common way. Um, to do uh, calorimetry or to find enthalpy. Okay, okay, go to the next slide. So the thing about this though is, is that while it's still an MCAT problem, which is good news, we're using the exact same equation, these problems always have a flip of perspective. And what I mean is, is that the MCAT is always gonna give you the wrong sign. All right, now that already happened to us on our previous example, but on the non-coffee cup problems, you just have to read and figure out if you're supposed to switch the sign or not, if they're trying to trick you. On these, you always have to swap the sign. Because you might not understand what I'm about to say, but it's good for the video. It's showing you the reaction from the perspective of the thermometer. You don't want the reaction from that perspective. You want it from the perspective of the reaction, which will always be the opposite of what MCAT gives you. Let me show you what I mean. It's calorimetry. Calorimetry is always MCAT, so we know that Q equals that. All right, so now we just have to find the things. Now, one immediate difference is notice how I said we're going to add one reactant and add another. Well, when I get to the M here, I need the mass of the entire everything in there. So this is where the adding will come into play. So it's giving me a little over a gram of sodium hydroxide being added to 150 grams of water. So we're gonna go ahead and say Q equals because it wants you to find the total heat here. <clears throat> we're gonna go ahead and go 151.095. All right. My C is my specific heat. It's creating a water solution. So we'll go straight to 4.18. All right. And it looks like we have an initial temperature of 25.3, which will be subtracting 23.5. Always. Okay, because you said initially it was 25.3. Oh, did I? Yeah. Yeah. Final minus initial. I'm sorry. That's the one I wrote initially, though, mm -hmm. for the record. Yeah, yeah. Now, look here. Stop working. I'm glad you're working. I love you. There is a word that starts with L somewhere in this problem. I want you to find the word that starts with L. Liberated. Liberated. What does it mean if something it's is free. liberated? It's being set free. It's being set free. So it's leaving. So it's exothermic. Look at this kid. This kid's smart. What sign must delta H have that Q here have? It must have a negative sign. But when you run this, those of y'all that are running it, like good little children's, it's going to give you this. But you're not going to report that, are you? Because in a coffee cup problem, you always have to reverse the sign. It's always giving it from the perspective of the measuring device. It's negative. It's not that hard. 
Good. Like a bag of chips. You, you are very soft. If the thermometer sees it as exothermic, it's endothermic. Questions? No. Now, this next problem that I'm going to work through uh, is another coffee cup problem with a, a little twist. You can kind of hear what the uh, why it's different. Will you swap it for me? <clears throat> it turns out that your enthalpy here can be thrown off if the measuring device itself steals heat from the reaction and you have to account for that stolen heat. The only time that you have to do the extra step in this last problem is if it gives you the specific heat of the measuring device too. You'll have a specific heat of the reaction, the stuff that you're using, and a specific heat of the thermometer, in which case it's wanting you to use a couple values. So let's take a look at this last one. All right, again, we're in a coffee cup. Hooray, hooray. Um, as I search and, and read what it wants me to find, uh, it says calculate the heat released. So again, it's Q that we're looking for, all right? And then we can start to find our information here. Um, if I look at my mass samples, it's sodium bromide that's being uh, added to uh, silver nitrate. And look, it's 50 grams of each. 50 plus 50 is 100 grams. All right. We need a specific heat. Now we're not using water, so we need to find the specific heat. It must be given to us somewhere, all right? And as my eyes search, dun, 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 dun. why am I not seeing it? Oh, 4.2, sorry. I knew it was up there. All right, the specific heat is 4.2, another part of the problem that's given. All right, and then we're gonna take a look at my change in temperature, which is going to be 25.4 minus, that is my final there is the 25.4, minus 23.65. All right, and now that's going to give you a value, but here's, here's the difference. Here's why you really wanna focus on this last part. It's giving you the heat capacity of the measuring device that is going to alter your answer. And it actually leads to another equation that you need to know, which is gonna be Q equals just cat. We don't care about the mass of the thermometer. We just care about how the specific heat of the measuring device is going to interact with that change. And by plugging this information in and finding two Qs, the sum of the Qs will be the, the total heat. Because this is going to give me the total heat of everything that the thermometer didn't interact with. This is going to give me the total heat of the, everything the thermometer did react with. And those two total heats together would be the total heat of everything that happened. So we can plug here. So let's go. Q equals, I need the specific heat of the thermometer. Look, it's another given value. It's 65. The change in temperature, exact same. All right, it's the exact same deal. And again, now we have a way to account for all of the heat movement that happened inside the cup. I'm going to get 735 joules from the normal end cap. End cap, I can tell. I'm going to get 113.75. from the bottom one. And then of course, by adding them together, we get an answer of 849 joules.
For those of y'all that can't see, there's still six people in the room that didn't go to lunch, and someone's about to shout out something smart. Wait. Oh, wait, I didn't look. Oh, wait, 848.75. No, it's in negative. Negative. Switch the sign. I stopped thinking. Switch the sign. Oh, right. You shake your head. I'm just so used to shaking my head at you, I think, that just... Why are you being so mean today? I was really thinking it was something like I was so lost in thought, and then I just see Shepard turn around and he's like... She knows I'm just messing with her. Now, again, this extra equation, first off, two things. It's not given to you, all right? But all I did was remove the M, so we don't care about the mass. And secondly, you only have to do this if they go through the trouble of giving you the specific heat of the measuring device. So it's, it's obvious, in other words, that there's a bunch of numbers. There's, there's extra numbers there. Yeah, 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 yeah. So many numbers. <laughs> yeah. 